Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to today's webinar, Express. Strong brands have multiple personalities. How do you identify yours? With our guest speaker, Richard Gillingwater, and which has been organized by the CIM Southwest Group. If you're a university student attending today's webinar, then you may want to sign up to the CIM Marketing Club. It'll keep you up to date with the latest trends, innovations, and concepts in the marketing industry. So I'd now like to hand over to Richard Gillingwater, founder and creative director of Emotional Branding, who is our guest speaker today. Over to you, Richard. Thank you, Phil, and welcome everybody. I'm really excited to be sharing for the first time this new research into archetypes and this new brand mapping tool, Radenby. To set the scene, let me start with a short story. A sage, hero and lover walk into a bar, but only order one drink. Why? The answer is because they are the same person. And just like interesting people, interesting brands are not one personality. The sage, hero and lover each conjure up within us all a set of thoughts, feelings and needs that help us tell a story, either as the storyteller or as a character. Brands, just like movie directors, use multiple archetypes and characters to help them tell interesting and complex stories through the way they complement each other or through the tension between them. There's a reason why it's the two Ronnies, Morecambe and Wise, Ant and Deck, because great stories, great storytellers, require tension between characters. And whilst there are two of them, each with their own internal different personality traits, they come together as one. So the question is, how do you identify what's your right blend of archetypes to tell your story? Just over two years ago, and with the help of people like Imperial College London, we started building Radenby to answer that very question. Radenby looks to understand archetypes, how they're expressed visually through a design language, how this is used to tell a narrative, and how that supports a brand strategy. Today, we've mapped almost 2,000 brands through the lens of 60 archetypes. We wanted to be able to map every type of brand, not just a few famous consumer brands. We wanted to map the good and the bad, the B2Bs, the global and the local, those whose budgets were big and those whose budgets weren't, to build a true picture of how brands really use archetypes. To our knowledge, mapping brands through the lens of 60 archetypes has never been done before. We did this because we wanted to see in more detail than ever before how brands use archetypes to tell their story. We wanted to identify what each archetype really looked and felt like through their visual language. Radenby is creating a data set of brands and a common language of archetypes. It will create a, a language for researchers, consultants, marketeers, and creatives alike. And you'll be able to see an archetype's visual language. You'll be able to access each brand's map and see where they're set against the competitors. You'll be able to play with different types of archetypes and see how they combine visually to help tell a story. And you'll also be able to map your own brands to help you define your strategy. And this will be available live later this year. So in the next 30 minutes, what will we cover? Well, firstly, there is a skill to be able to tune into the nuance of 60 archetypes. Just like a master perfumer is called the nez, the French for nose, for good reason. You have to develop your nay, your ability to feel emotions with design, imagery and words, to tune into the different subtle notes within a brand's perfume, its visual language. By quieting the mind, you can become aware of the physical emotions evoked in the body through a piece of communication. Does it make you feel like smiling, make you feel like open to new possibilities or closed and strong and determined? Otherwise, you're probably not tuned in to that piece of communication, a little bit like watching a TV program while reading a book. You're not fully present. What we learned when we tuned in is that nearly all brands are not one character, not one emotional feeling, they're complex stories. Multiple stories led together, each potentially using different combinations of archetypes to help tell their story. Building the right narrative at the right time and place allows audiences to find those archetypes those stories that are most relevant to them and their needs. Archetypes can work together to communicate stories more powerfully, and they do this best of all when they create tension in a narrative. 
Working with multiple archetypes can be a challenge. So understanding when there's too many or not the right ones is important in order to manage the collective whole, the overall identity of the brand. The main factor sitting behind all of this is technology. The internet, social media, the never ending demand for content means brands can now tell much richer, more complex narratives, making them more adaptable, able to speak to multiple audiences and helping them achieve a sustainable advantage over time. First, let's take a step back. Brands have things they want to say, they, that they're innovative, that they have the right solution, or that you can feel confident with them. Stories, as we know, are a great way to connect random elements and put them together in a way that helps us learn, to learn how to thrive and survive. It's how our brains are hardwired to remember and share knowledge. Once a brand has identified what it wants to say, it can then identify how it wants to say it. Choosing an archetype or a blend of archetypes, either as a storyteller or as a character, loads the story, as we said, with more meaning. For example, by telling this narrative through the voice of the creative, we can tell the story one way. We can emphasize certain values and behaviors as each archetype carries with it specific feelings. Or we could add the voice of the rebel to tell aspects of the story in a different way, with a different feeling. Each archetype has its own narrative, its own emotions and needs that help you tell a story more powerfully. As we calibrated and built the model, we talked to marketeers from around the world to get their feedback. While we did this, we learned that many avoided or were reluctant to use archetypes directly, at least overtly as labels or at board level because of a lack of credibility. If you have to choose from one of 12, and here we see the 12 primary archetypes, this can be seen both limiting and crude. Consumers also find it hard to tune into all but a few of the classic archetypes, like the hero and the lover. Many other archetypes, although felt, are not easily recognized. Within the industry itself, definitions are varied and vague and open to individual interpretation. I can remember on several occasions marketing directors saying there's no way the chief executive is going to sign up to us being the magician. We're not Paul Daniels, who, by the way, isn't the magician archetype. He's part of the Jester family. It's these fears of these comments like this that means marketeers avoid using archetypes as much as they could. If you Google or try to learn about archetypes, you'll often find the same few famous brands used all the time. Often you'll get one or two examples per archetypes and then they start quoting movie characters because they're running out of examples. Meaning that for many marketeers, especially in a B2B world, archetypes feel irrelevant, not professional, and so don't know how to use them effectively. Even with a brand like Apple, you can find it defined as one archetype online and then later as another. One B2C brand that I'm sure you'll have come across is Harley Davidson. And if you Google them, they come up as the iconic rebel archetype. Yet, clearly, neither of these home pages feel like a rebel brand. There is a reality gap between the headlines and how brands really communicate. So which archetypes exist in Harley? What archetypes are used by Barber to tell their story? What can we each brand learn from the other? Do they have one dominant archetype or do they blend several? each coming to the front at different times. How differentiated are they from others in their sector? Before we start exploring these two brands and others in more detail, let us see how good your archetypal nose is. How many archetypes can you see or feel in this corporate video from Telefonica? Have a good look at the images and, and the words. Can you recognize which images feel the same? What archetypes are being communicated in each frame? Which ones jump out? Which take a while to tune into? Do you know what you're looking for? Do you have a list in your mind to check against? If I say the caregiver, the explorer, the futurist, the athlete, do these now appear where before you couldn't label them? What about the liberator? What other ones could there be? How different would the images of the cyclist and the runners feel if they were just by themselves? Is there an aspect of the companion within the athlete? How does the couple dancing 
change how you may feel about the two cyclists above looking at the sunset. How do these different archetypes work together to tell the story? What about the more subtle images like those in the bottom left? Can you tune into them? Which images caught your eye immediately? How much does your personality, how you're feeling right now, influence what you look at and what you ignore? If you like sports or you like family or more family orientated, do those archetypes jump out for you? Do you recognize them over others? So overall, what do you feel when you look at all of these images? Is this a video for you about caring? Or is this video about success? Because the video uses multiple archetypes, we can experience this story in a way that's more relevant to you because of its use of archetypes relating to you. Until we can better understand what each archetype looks like, feels like, it's hard to identify them. It's hard to understand how they work together. We can easily be blind to their use, especially the more subtle ones. Once pointed out, however, they're easier to find. Regardless of whether you see them immediately or not, they are there, and they are there for a reason. Polyphonica, like many brands, has many stories to tell. They want to talk about being more human, a global player, ability to anticipate the future, slow down climate change, committed to equality. They want to say we're open, bold, and trusted, all of these things. So brands are not one character, but a blend for a reason. De Beers is not just the lover, as is often quoted, but the creative and the sovereign. It's also a blend of the guardian, seeker, provider, and shaman. Through the imagery, the photographs, the styling, the tone, when they want to talk about certainty for future generations, ethical sourcing and conservation. So how do we measure all of this? How do we map a brand's personality? Because brands feel different, they have different personalities. Currently, you can choose from your own set of values, or you can choose from one of the 12 primary archetypes or select from hundreds more. You can use AI or crowdsourcing to scrape content against preset terminology, resulting in spider diagrams that show you a brand score. And you can map archetypes relative to different polarities. Radunby hopes to take this to the next level, to give you greater clarity through the visual data set of 60 archetypes. Radunby is built around opposing emotion needs. Emotions are critical in changing behaviors and guiding behaviors. So they are a fundamental part of any brand and the role that archetypes play. We all experience daily tension between six core opposing needs within ourselves. For example, to varying degrees, we all have a need for variety. We all want to go somewhere different for a change. But we also have an opposing need for certainty. We like the bus to run on time. We like to know things are going to be there. The tension between these, uh, these forces creates is a critical component within any narrative and an important part within a brand's DNA. So we started by positioning each primary archetype based on their emotional need between the six primary needs. For example, out of all the primary archetypes, the sage has the greatest need for certainty, while the jester has the greatest need for variety. By placing these archetypes on the map, you are starting to explore the spectrum of human emotional needs they represent. But as we implied, 12 does not give us enough detail. So we identified where to position each of the four subfamily members within the map. Now each archetype has these four family members and they themselves are positioned relative to the six needs. So if we look at the sage out of its family, the one that has the highest need for certainty is the strategist. And we can look across the whole board and see how they're all related to each other. There's a, a transition between one place and another, which creates the map feel. There's a blend between them. So the closest to the alchemist, for example, is the maverick, the ambassador, the advocate, the reformer, and the rebel. And so they're Sisters and brothers sit close to them, and this is how the map works. 
behind each of these archetypes is a visual data set of real brand images that helps you to bring to life the emotional needs and feelings of the archetypes. For the first time, we can look and say, this is what an adventurer feels like. This is what a shapeshifter or a visionary or a muse feels like. And all the images have been calibrated so there's a distinct look and feel that matches that archetype. But images are rarely just one archetype. Most of these images are in themselves a blend of archetypes. So through Rathenby, we are able to identify what certain combinations of different archetypes look and feel like. So once we have a data set, we can start seeing more clearly how brands use archetypes. So let's go back to Harlem Barber. How similar do you think they are? They certainly feel similar here. When we see sample videos, stills, websites, literature together, you start to feel how similar these two brands are. In fact, Barber's recent video campaign here on the right feels far more like a rebel than Harley's video on the far left. When we look at the map and where the brands are positioned, we can see which archetypes they use. We see the similarities and where they're different. And through the connecting lines that join each individual image, we can see the dynamic relationship between the archetypes as they tell their story. With both Harley and Barber, the patriarch is in fact the strongest archetype, more than the rebel. Although one patriarch may be on a bike and the other walking on an estate, they feel the same. Both tell a story of seeking a close connection, a position of status, within their community, while also having a sense of independence and exploration. Both blend the patriarch, rebel, companion, seeker, and hero to tell this story. By comparing these patterns, we can see how well the archetypes align to a narrative, which archetypes are potentially surplus, and which archetypes could be employed to tell the story in a better way. If you want to be in a position of status amongst your community, there is no point in being the scientist. So the patriarch, the companion, the seeker, these are the best archetypes to talk about those things. We look at lots of maps, and from these, we've been able to see patterns, patterns that reflect what we call the three dimensions of a narrative. The first dimension is the about me story. When a brand wants to stand out or fit in by telling you what they do, this is their language. The second dimension is when a brand is more focused on the customer and making them feel something in that moment. And the third dimension is when a brand looks to empower you like a coach and help you grow and change your behaviours in the long term. Each of these are all different in the way that they approach their use of archetypes. The, most, the ones on the right hand side, the three dimensions, use them in a more sophisticated way. Whereas the one dimensions don't need to do that. They can be more direct. And here, when we look at three business schools, with Harvard on the left, we see just a few archetypes from their mapping. This is partly because they have a simple message, but usually they want to simply talk about one thing, themselves. And that's fine for certain brands in certain positions. And it's by using the map, we can identify those strategies. With London Business School in the middle, we see a more expansive pattern. London Business School still wants to talk about themselves from a position of status, but also to weave in their narrative, the student story. One that in their case is about a supportive community, a narrative designed to make you feel important and to feel you would be happy there. If we look at IE Business School, we again see similar areas indicative of the sector, but like busy bees, they appear to be working harder to talk about their story through the use of more archetypes. In IE's case, their narrative talks about their new approach to teaching in a virtual world and how their student experience will be an empowering one. This requires more archetypes. This is a more complex story to bring to life. In this case, they use the visionary and the magician to help tell their story in, in a way that makes it feel amazing and future focused. Things that London Business School or Harvard don't need. So no one strategy is necessarily better than the other. Through the map, each brand can consider and reflect upon the use of archetypes to see if it fits with their strategy. 
it also helps to be able to map out and see this so people across the whole organization can be aligned to that story manage it better and help deliver the strategy so can you overdo it clearly you can if your narratives and archetypes don't match don't blend properly there is a possibility of disconnect to the story confusion as to who you are and an overload that makes people believe you're not authentic here we see a classic B2B page, promoting product in a very clean, neutral way. But even this contains some subtle blends of archetypes through its use of colors, through the layout and styling. But when we expand on this page, on this website, we can see even more archetypes introduced through the visionary product style shots used and the see ahead change tomorrow campaign created in a more futuristic archetypal style. And then when you actually dive in to that video itself and look at the actual slides, you see more archetypes appear like the caregiver. Then you explore other pages on the website and the product pages and it introduces even more archetypes. They'll use a different archetype like the family, the healthier life, the optimist, and the way that all is, is built together, the status, the direction, the way the angle of the buildings all leads to influence and, and imply certain archetypes. When we look at then the whole of their map, we can see there is a potential for a narrative to flow. We can see how we can move and tell a story using the advocate, the judge, the sage, the visionary, even up to the entertainer. But when you look at the layout, there is no focus. Each story is not given the time to build momentum or depth. So whilst a lot of the map is covered, it is in a random way. This, that means that the potential for stories to connect, to be delivered and to build an emotional connection is reduced. In contrast, if we look at Peloton, we can see an equally diverse portfolio of archetypes, but they are more centered, more clustered around archetypes that align well to their story. At the heart, is the athlete and hero. And when we look at different campaigns, we often see this is repeated. But around that, other archetypes are introduced, like the hedonist, guardian, and advocate, helping the brand say something in a slightly different way to a slightly different audience, therefore potentially reaching a wider audience base. Another example, too good to go and innocent. Both brands feel similar. Both use the innocent archetypes as part of their mix. But the different blends of archetypes they use is different, which means that people can actually interpret a single piece of communication quite differently, even though that piece feels the same. So mapping to good to go's communication, we see their innocent archetype in the bottom left hand corner, expressed through the idealist and muse archetypes more. Then it goes up through the activist, the reformer, and up to the sage which, and the solution provider that is the detective. We can also see an equal balance between the need for self-growth and the provider on the bottom left and the need for contribution to others expressed through the healer bottom right, plus the splash of humour as a provocateur in the top right. With innocent, we see them firmly grounded in the innocent archetype but with a shift to the right-hand side of the map towards the most heroic archetype, that is the rescuer. Here, we see two pieces of communication, one from each brand, both trying to communicate similar messages and both having a very similar feel. However, the overall feel of the archetypes used by each brand can impact, and I would suggest do impact, how people respond and feel about that. So because of too good to go archetypes are more about actively campaigning for a better solution and use the detective and activist to complement the innocent family. Their campaigns can feel that they are about providing real solutions. The activist has room and has a role to play within the blend of other archetypes. The innocent archetype wants you to feel good. The innocent brand wants you to feel good, but in their case, more like a hero. And they're bringing in that hero archetype. Now they use the activist, but it can get overpowered by the other archetypes. 
So whilst it's there, it's, it's just not coming through as well. Meaning that whilst Innocent is trying to drive social change with his campaign and use the activist archetypes at times, too good to use of its archetypes are potentially more effective in influencing change. A review of archetypes wouldn't be complete without looking at Apple and how their narrative runs from the engineer, a subset of the magician, through to the reformer, a part of the rebel family, down through to the maverick, into the creative artist and storyteller. A beautiful spine that runs through their brand, which other archetypes blend into in various campaigns in different ways to tell that brand story. With Sacconi and Adidas, we can see how unique stories are formed, even within sectors that can often feel very similar, that use similar images, that use almost identical products. While both fit in the hero family, Sarconi is more of a seeker and activist in its archetypes. While Adidas follows a similar route to Apple from reformer to creative, which means their narrative can express, like Apple, more the idea of individual creativity. Different patterns, the spacing between archetypes, where archetypes are on the map and the number of archetypes used all help indicate not only the story, but also the strategy of the brand. With these six brands, again, in a sector that's often hard to differentiate one brand from another, you're able to see the difference. See which brands are more three-dimensional in their narrative, which are trying to tell richer stories, and which emotional triggers through their use of archetypes they're trying to use. We can also interrogate this sector. We can look at the sector as a whole and see which archetypes are prominent. And from these prominent archetypes, like the sage, detective, visionary, and guide, we can identify easily, because of the nature of their storytelling, what the story is for that sector. And you can calculate how far a brand is from the mean average of the actual sector. So here, the sector nar narrative for this industry is the knowledge, solutions, and certainty to guide you to the future with the underbelly of an empowering a global community. We can also interrogate different um, sectors and see how they compare and see, see how they use archetypes differently and in different ways across the map. We can also see, in this case, which, uses, which are images which are predominant with the sage in the top left, what archetypes sit naturally with that partner, what archetypes generally flow and generally come together to help tell that story. So Radenby helps you tune into a brand's unique blend of archetypes. It gives you a better understanding of what each archetype really looks and feels like, what emotional needs each brand uses within its narrative and how archetypes are used to create tension in a story. Radenby is building a community of experts that can identify the visual language of 60 archetypes, helping us better understand how stories are told through a blend of archetypes. Okay, great. Um, that's excellent. Thanks very much. A really insightful presentation. Um, so we're now going to have a short Q&A session, and we'll try and get through as many as we can in the next 10 to 15 minutes. What I'll do is I'd be interested to know how you considered diversity in this, diversity in the research team, but also in the brands you've analysed, and which cultures you think this would apply to. The archetypes must vary so much depending on culture and country? Well, the background to archetypes generally has looked into this, um, this issue for a long time. And are archetypes global in, in their role and through their visual language? So what we're doing is we are mapping brands from around the world. And we've spoken to marketeers from around the world. And, and so what we're doing is we're actually gathering a visual data set for each archetype. And that may very well change, but the underlying feeling doesn't. And so what, you're, you, what we're getting in the data set is if you looked at, let's say, the sage, or we looked at the hero, whilst they might use different styles and different elements, there's an overriding similar feeling. And that's what we're mapping, the feeling around those. And so what we, we build up for the first time is a full data set that's applicable whether it's in the Far East, whether it's in Europe or in South America. Okay, um, there's a question around um, te technical aspects of the mapping, I think. So 
do you, should we assume it is the business that allocates these archetypes or do these maps show what the consumer end user feel the archetypes are too? Yeah, so this is, um, we map them because a little bit like the Pathuma and having the expertise to be able to tune into those subtle brands, we initially map those and then we calibrate them against the um, data set that we have. So you can look at the different combinations. You might say this is 20% this and 10% that. And then you can look at similar things in the data set. And it is all about just comparative, having comparative data sets that look and feel or feel the same. And whilst it's not perfect and, and, and no system is because if you woke up one morning and felt in a bad mood compared to a good mood, and you interpret things slightly differently, it is giving us a far better picture than we currently have. Um, so that's so it is definitely based on us at the moment. It's, it's definitely based on developing those skills and training people who want to use the system. So when the system comes live, um, there will be a training process for doing that because it's a little bit like a wine tester. You know, you could go around and say, well, Yes, we can get the views of customers as to what this wine feels like, and, and that's valid in its own sense. But actually, if you get some experts who can tune into the very subtleties, they can give you a more expert view of that. And that's what this is trying to become. Um, again, back to the mapping. Is the size of the circle in the archetype, archetype map the amount of content or importance? Do the connector lines denote direction or relationship? When developing the map, will you be able to connect the content evidence um, and the archetype? Yes. So there's a lot you can do with the data because sitting behind there is a whole load of numbers. Um, and in essence, the bigger the circle, the more strength the archetype is. So if it's a small little dot, then it's just registering as a small element within that. And, and equally, what, what's quite fascinating within this and the connections is two archetypes might be on opposing sides and often can be on opposing sides of the map. And it could be that it's almost 50-50. You could look at it one minute and you can sense the hedonist, the pleasure or the ruler. And it's like you're flipping between these two polarities. And so just the fact that they're positioned on the map and the size of them and the relative positioning next to other archetypes gives you more indication gives you a visual representation more than just data itself um, and when you actually do the mapping and people can map their own things on there as well you, you create the circles the oval space and you can just overlap so it might be for example um, the healer sits next to the a romantic and so it's, it could be mainly romantic but it just overlaps and you just draw the overlap so it is the size it's the relationship it's the overlap that are all important. As people's needs develop and technology evolves, do you think the archetypes will change or are they, or are they finite? This is relevant to diversity too. This is such a lovely question because when we set out, one of the interesting things was, is there, are people using these archetypes? There, you know, there, were, there are 12 primary archetypes, there's these 60 within, archetypes within the families but are people using them are they relevant anymore um, for example in the data set we can see that the detective is one of the most common used archetypes um, in the in 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 the out of the whole data set um, but you, we can also see that they are used across different areas or, or, or there are other archetypes but as we build this data set over time uh, we will be able to see whether or not archetypes increase in strength or, or they actually change in their visual style. So what does a hero look like? And, and as we mentioned before, the whole thing about patriarchs, it might be that in, 10 years ago, they were very male dominated and now we're seeing them very much more female dominated in that patriarchal role. So it's going to become a great research tool um, as, as we map year by year and see actually how archetypes fall. The, the principle that there are these archetypes, that there is a hero, that there is a sage, are pretty embedded, 
But what they look and feel like and how that evolves and what that relates to can very easily change. Okay, um, there's some specifics around um, different uh, sectors and different brands. Um, but I think this question probably covers a multiple multitude of scenes here. So somebody, somebody who's actually works for a broker and also somebody else whose companies are lift motoring and control manufacturers, more or less saying what archetypes um, would be appropriate. But I guess the overall question is, is this one say if i'm a brand manager if i haven't explicitly mapped my brand archetypes like this before where do you suggest i start do you, do you start with a template go through old campaigns and try to map them etc do you try to strategically aim your campaign imagery to be a variety moving forward while looking at a map just an example of timeline of how to implement mm -hmm. this please so so what you, what you do is you first of all look at the sector that you're in and through the maps, you can just look at the overall sector and, and just explore what archetypes they use, a little bit like we did in, in, in the case study where we could see there was an overall narrative, there's an overall place where most of the competitors sit. Then you sit down and say, right, what am I trying to say? What are the key messages? And once you've worked out what you're trying to say, you can then work out which archetypes best tell that message. So for example, if you want to talk about a visionary idea, if you want to be talking about guiding people to a new destination, a new solution, or if you want to be uplifting, if you want to let them feel free and liberated, there are clearly archetypes um, like, like the angel or the guide that are more suitable for different narratives. And then what you can do through the model is just say, right, show me what it looks like when you combine the guide and the angel and what brands are doing that. And are there any brands in my sector doing that? And then you can actually calculate how far as a percentage you are away from the average score within that whole sector. So I would definitely start with an analysis of the, the sector, then work out what you want to say, and then figure out how you can bring that to life through different blends of archetypes and just play with it and see that this is a real data set. So these are not made up images. They're not just placed in there because they want to feel like that. They're actual images. And what you can then say is, well, actually, is anybody able to blend the guide and the angel? Are there any examples like that? Oh, wow. Yeah, that's what we want to look like. That, that, yeah, this brand in this sector exactly reflects. And what you realize very quickly when you do this and you start to study is how similar brands are across. You know, that we think we're all quite unique as in personalities, but in fact, it's easily replicated. So it's quite quick to go, oh, yeah, we're like that. That's how we want to be. So it becomes very quick to make decisions about the direction of a brand using the model. Can you look across um, sectors as well? Because I was just referring back to your, you know, begin at the beginning you were comp comparing Harley with Barber. So, so using the model, you can clearly compare any brand against any other brand, um, and you can also um, look for brands with similar profiles. So you can choose choose a certain set of profiles and then pull up all the brands that have those similar blends of archetypes. Um, one of the things that we're doing at the moment, it, and the reason why it's not fully live yet, is working out all the possibilities and making sure that the software enables us to do that. So one of the things is to actually compare sector for sector has become something that, that has been a bit of a request. So um, we're trying to build that into the system. Um, it's a slightly different uh, slant on it. The archetypes seem to focus on positive, on the positive, but what about devious negative types like a devil? How do these fit? Yes. So e each archetype has its negative. I mean, there's a lot. That's why this is like an expert tool. Yeah, this, this is not, um, this is not a, oh, we'll just, we'll just have a little conversation about archetypes. This is trying to be the most advanced tool for building a brand's narrative through archetypes. And within each archetype, there is a positive and negative. So every archetype, sage, hero, the, the provocateur, they all have a positive side and they all have a negative side. And that gets mapped as well. Yeah, I'm sure there are some examples, but uh, none yes. come to mind. Okay, um, again, here's a slightly um, left field question. Do you think do you think newspapers use archetypes in their news stories or their portrayal of celebrities or stars of the entertainment of the entertainment world? If they do, can brands learn from this and how? Totally. I, and, and the biggest place that brands can learn is through movies about archetypes, um, because 
archetypes archetypes don't just exist in isolation they're there around narratives and so it, there's often formulas to the way these archetypes work together there are and that's what's quite interesting when you just look at for example the sage as we did as the lead archetype in that what characters generally work with it so there are fundamental patterns that brands can learn about the types of stories that they could tell through the use of these archetypes i mean the classic one is the hero's journeys but there are so many other subset narratives which use certain sets of archetypes and they repeat patterns okay um got time for just a couple more uh, questions richard so um how do you persuade the seed suite to, uh, to take this seriously particularly if you work in a b in the b2b so it, that's why i built this um you know i've been working this profession for a long time and that was the number of times i've been in that position where it's credibility because you just go what's this based on so because this is a big data set you literally can go into that data set and you can call it up and you can say look these all feel the same don't they and you go yes they do there is a common feeling to that architect yes so regardless of whether you call it the explorer or the adventurer whether you call it the patriarch it doesn't really matter there is a feeling and it meets an emotional need in people and this look and feel which everybody can then see says yes that's how we want to feel like and then you can find the blends so it is because you can visually show a large data set of lots of brands who use this look and feel especially in the b2b world that that's what it's designed for okay great um final question then uh which i think this is uh common question from a lot of our viewers today um you said you can map your own brands on the site how do you do that yeah so within the tool what you'll be able to do is you take each individual image so you can take a page from a website a campaign and you create the circle you create your own database and then what you can do is is look and calibrate that so you might say for example this one image is 20 percent this and you literally draw it up yourself and then you call up similar images and to see whether they feel the, the same and, and what you're doing as you're doing this is you're you're tuning your nose to it you're becoming more sensitive you're you're becoming aware of those subtleties so it's a learning process so this whole tool is about developing experts uh, in archetypes okay that's that's great thank you very much uh, richard we have we have now sort of run out of time for our q a although there's several other questions which i haven't had a chance to get around to asking you um we had some really good questions and um it's a shame that we have run out of time um but thank you thank very you. much for answering the ones that you did um some really great advice and hopefully some useful tips that our viewers can take away so sadly, that's all the time we have for our webinar today. I'd like to say a big thank you to Richard for his excellent presentation and to the CIM Southwest group for organizing the event. We do hope that you've enjoyed the session and found it interesting and worthwhile. We'll be back with our next webinar, Express Equity, Diversity and Inclusion at Work, more than just lip service, with Claire Kemsey from Hayes Marketing on Tuesday, the 29th of March, again at one o'clock. You'll find further details listed on the events page on the CIM website where you'll also be able to register for the session. So on behalf of CIM, that just leaves me to thank Richard once again for a fantastic presentation and to say a thank you to you for joining us today. Take care, everyone, and we look forward to welcoming you again to our webinars in the future.